We humble ourselves before you this morning because we, we realize that were it not for you, we would still be lost. We would, we would be apart from you. And you have, through your Son, given us your holiness. And God, this morning, we are, are deeply grateful. For even before the foundation of the world, you saw our need and, and chose us. God, you are you are wonderful, magnificent, holy God. And so this morning we, we thank you for another opportunity uh, that you, you woke us up, Lord. And we, we dare not take that for granted, but you woke us up. And and you gave us a way out that we would come and, and demonstrate our thankfulness in worship, in praise. And so this morning we do praise you, we do worship you. We exalt your son and we pray that uh, through him someone might come to be um, in this relationship with you as well. It's in his name that we do pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Manna. God bless you all. Uh, what a pleasure it is to uh, again stand before you uh, by the power of God. Uh, we all uh, find ourselves here this morning able to give him thanks and to praise him uh, for his kindness towards us. We're going to look again at Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and we're going to start our reading this morning at verse 17. This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And Father, we do again thank you for uh, the opportunity to delve into your word, uh, the letter that you have written to us through your apostle Paul. Uh, we thank you, Lord God, for every word penned. We pray, Father, that you will indeed uh, be the teacher this morning. We pray, God, that you will bless your word and that you will edify your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Last week, we took a, uh, a look at the, the holiness of God. And why did we do that? 
Well, we think here that Paul is encouraging, exhorting the, the saints uh, to walk in holiness. Uh, these next few verses are are, are full of Paul's encouragement uh, for them to to have a way of life that is different than their old life, and it's based in understanding God's holiness. And so, what we understood and understand today about God's holiness is is that He is separate. Uh, that he is pure, uh, that he is distinctive uh, in, his, in his nature, uh, in his being. And, and not only that, but because he is, he is holy in his nature, everything that he does uh, is perfect, is pure, is holy as well. Paul before going into this, um, this discussion on holiness, wants us to understand that our relationship in the body of Christ should be governed by love. In fact, in verse 16, he says, from whom the whole body, that is Christ, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So the body can, cannot function and, and build and grow unless it does it in the context, in the sphere of love. Paul, if you look at all of Paul's writings, it's sprinkled with the theme of love, but in Ephesians, there is a greater concentration on love than any of his other books. So there's something about God and God's love, his holiness, and his love in the context of this holiness. We, we are to pursue holiness. We have that responsibility. Uh, we are to love as God has uh, encouraged us to love. God's love is, because it's in the context of his holiness, doesn't have the same um, imperfections that we have in our love. His, his love is, is perfect. It's beyond um, what we can even imagine. The fact that he died for us uh, demonstrates his, his holy and righteous love. And so in these words, we, we see God demonstrating holiness through his love. And, and Paul uses the same word in the Greek that or a, not the same word, but he uses a word in Greek that is the same as the Hebrew word that Moses uses when he talks uh, to the Israelites about being like God, being holy like God because God is holy. Paul uses the same word in Ephesians to describe the Ephesian saints in that they are saints. And the word there is hagios, meaning holy, separate, set apart. And so this suggests for us that there is a, a responsibility for resembling, uh, resembling the, the holiness of God and our responsibility uh, to pursue holiness. And so as we look at these verses in uh, beginning in 17, uh, we want to uh, understand who Paul is talking to. Very interesting. When you look at verse 17, it says, This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, 
in the futility of their mind. Just as the Gentiles also walk. Well, aren't they Gentiles that he's writing to? Well, they formerly were Gentiles. Paul is making a distinction here. He has called them saints. And so now he goes further to make the distinction that you are no, you are no longer Gentiles. This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. So he could have said, this I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as you all used to walk. Well, in fact, he did say that when you go back over to um, the second chapter, he says, formally, you walked according to the course of this world. So he comes back to reaffirm what he said earlier. You are no longer Gentiles and Gentiles here, meaning in the context of what Paul is saying, unregenerate people. In fact, Paul goes on to describe them by saying that they walk in the futility of their minds. Now, he he sets the the context here even further by saying, I'm telling you this based on my relationship with the Lord. This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord. He's demonstrating his authority to say to the Ephesian saints, do not walk according to the way the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. So, so if they are saints, if they are believers, why then is he sounding this alarm? He, it, it seems as if he's concerned uh, for them and, and what they're doing and, and their lifestyle. Well, I think part of the answer is in two uh, portions of Scripture. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter. Paul recognizes something about believers that leads him to write these words uh, to them. And I think part of it is born out of what he's written to the Roman saints. Look at verse 6 in chapter 8. Actually, let's go back to verse 1 so that we get some context here. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life is in Christ Jesus, has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So Paul is reckoning back to the flesh. He knows that if we set our minds on things of the flesh, then we tend to live that way. We're going to walk that way. The, the, the phrase there, mindset, is the word that 
means you are going after something. And so what Paul is saying here is that our minds should be going after the spirit of God and not going after the things of the flesh. And so Paul is wanting the Ephesian saints to understand that you are no longer Gentiles. You are no longer unregenerate people, but you are now born again believers. And so do the things that believers do. Set your mind on things above. Go after the spirit and not the flesh. In 2 Peter, the second chapter, we see a similar reference. Second Peter chapter 2, we're starting at uh, verse 11. It says, whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord, but these, like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct, to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. I think I'm reading the wrong verse. I'm sorry. First Peter, my bad. I said, that doesn't sound right. First Peter chapter 2. Here we go. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. So what is Peter saying here, which is similar to what Paul is saying? It's similar in that Peter is saying we, we should be living in this world as if we are strangers. We are aliens. We, we do not belong here. This is not our home. And so we should not allow what goes on here to influence us. At the end of the day, a Christian should ask themselves, my choices that I made today, my choices that I made last week, the choices that I make tomorrow, what are they governed by? If someone were to examine my choices, are my choices based on the culture that surrounds me or, or are my choices based on my heavenly father's will for my life? That's what Paul is saying to these Christians. Yes, sir. First Peter chapter two, verse 11 and 12. I'm sorry that I confused everybody there. Yes, sir. And so he wants them to, to understand who who they are. They are not of the former life. They are not Gentiles. We now want to understand what is he saying to them? Well, Paul uses two very long sentences which are contrasting sentences to, to help the saints understand that their walk must be in holiness. The sentences Start with verse 17. This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality, 
for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Okay, so that's one sentence. The second one is, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. The second sentence, two long sentences that contrast each other. Even though they contrast each other, Paul is focusing on the mind. First, he deals with the, the futility of mind. And, and this is the, the Gentiles, the unregenerate souls. Futility here is, is a word that means aimless, void of, of any useful goal, uh, going after something and, and not having any real purpose other than to, to satisfy yourself. It, is, it means devoid of truth and appropriateness, wanting something but never achieving it. You think of, um, of Solomon. He said, vanity of life. You're going after stuff and you don't achieve your ultimate goal, which is joy and peace and happiness and success. And here, the, the, the Gentiles, their, their minds are futile. They, they have no aim except that which is to please themselves. But then he talks about the saints in verse 23, and he says that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The renewed mind here is one that has been renovated by God. And, and it's this, it's an ongoing practice. God is changing our minds as we yield to him. Now, we once had a, a futile mind. We once lived like the Gentiles, but now we're different. And so what is the result of these two minds? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is that Paul, the words that are on the page, Paul wants to understand the very distinct difference between these two individuals, these two minds. And so he uses very um, strong language to describe the futile mind. He says, being darkened in their understanding. The word there, darken, means to be blind. And, and it's happening to them from outside sources. So you think of this in terms of the culture. If you're living in a culture that denies that God even exists, and you, and you pay attention to this culture, you become blind to truth and reality. We all had uh, this state before. I remember uh, before I got saved, I, I used to play uh, pinochle. In fact, it was double deck pinochle. I don't know if any of you all ever played double deck pinochle. Well, one day I was playing with uh, some friends, and I don't know how the discussion came up, but we were talking about having fun and, 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 the, and the subject of eternal life came up. And, and I said, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to hell because I'm going to party. And, and to think about even saying that then, to think about that now, I had to be darken in my, in my view, my thought, my thinking, to believe that there's a party in hell where you're going to enjoy yourself playing cards and drinking and, you know, doing whatever. That's a darkened mind. That's the, the darkness that Paul is speaking of here. Darkened in their understanding. 
all that they understand is is captured in darkness. They are excluded from the life of God. This exclusion is is an estrangement, a separation from God where, where, where God and they, they have no love, no sensitivity, no understanding of the life of God. None. No affection, no interest. It's interesting how this progression takes place. Paul says that being darkened in their understanding and excluded from the life of God because, because of the ignorance that is in them. So within them is an ignorance, a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, a lack of care for the things of God because of the hardness of their hearts. This is, um, it's interesting because the, the word here, hardness of their hearts, would, would lead you to believe that it's the same as the word callous, which falls in, which is in uh, verse 19. Uh, but it's a different word. It, it is like covering. There's a covering over their heart. But it's different in that when you think about sinners as we were, they don't hide their sin. This word here says that the hardness that is in their heart is, is demonstrated. It's obvious. You see it. One picture of that that you might think of is of the, the gay pride parade. There was a time, and it wasn't that long ago, when, when if you talked about being, well, in fact, the word gay wasn't even used. It was homosexual. And... And those who weren't homosexual had all kind of other words for people who were homosexual. And if you were homosexual, you didn't flaunt it. You, in fact, they said you were in the closet. And, and so it wasn't really out there in front of you. But now, it's it's not, it's not just out of the closet. It is just, it is in your face, obvious and shameful, but they're not. It is horrible to, to in this gay pride parade, you see all kinds of stuff going on. Maryland, very narrowly opposed the uh, proposed legislation to allow um, same-sex marriages. Now, you can believe that it's going to come back. And they're going to keep trying. And that's what this word here means, is that it is their hearts are hard and you can see the evidence of it. It is in your face insensitive to moral rightness. Paul goes on to say, having, having become callous, so their, heart, their hearts are hardened, and now having become callous, and, and that's a progression, because it gets worse. The hardness of the heart, it gets worse. Calluses don't happen all at once. You know, you, in fact, my grandson, Matthew, his hands are so soft. 
I mean, it, it, it's baby skin. And we all were born with baby skin. But years of working with your hands and doing, you could just do anything and the skin becomes tough so that you, you don't feel things. I've got calluses on my hands right right there in, in you know just below the finger and you can stick a pen literally you can stick a pen in that piece of meat and you won't feel it in fact the word there callus is the word where we get a word for um, analgesic it is the word that means no feeling left. They've lost all ability to be sensitive to moral rightness. It's gone. They're so accustomed to, to doing what's wrong, they just totally ignore God's morality. And so what this has done is it has led them. They have, it says, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Now, it's interesting here that... Um, we, we say in our own minds, oh, man, that is just, oh, that's terrible. You know, they, they, they're living horrible lives. So why is Paul telling us about what they do? Because he's concerned that we will do the same things. As, as I was studying, I was reading various uh, pieces of information and what kept coming back to me is the status of today's culture and and today's culture is best understood through the media TV being the greatest of all and so there once was a time when a talk show you could listen to a talk show and and you could actually be okay and not be offended but talk shows have, have gone the way of the culture. In fact, they have led the way, quite frankly. Language and, and, and sexual uh, innuendos and discussions and comedy shows. I mean, it used to be a time when you could have the family hour. In fact, there was a study done by the uh, Parents Television Council. And, and they found that 90% of family hour entertainment contained objectionable content. I remember Mama watching Lucy, Lucy Ball. And if any of you watch Lucy and Desi, they never even slept in the same bed. And if they were, in, there were times when they kind of wound up in bed together. If you notice and remember, Desi's leg was on the outside of the bed. They, he wasn't fully in the bed. It was that concern for what was being transmitted across the TV that has been lost. It's gone. In 2001, that's what, 10 years ago. The eight hour, the eight o'clock hour had experienced a 50% increase in violence, 22% increase in sexual content, and three quarters of the programs had bad language. Fox TV or Fox Network was the worst. And so that was 10 years ago. So now in 10 years, it's gotten worse. Now, I don't know what the numbers are, but it is worse. It is difficult to turn on the tube and watch something that isn't profane, sexual, violent. 
but we watch it. Well, not everybody. I have to admit that I, I'm a shoot 'em up guy. Uh, you know, if there's a shoot 'em up, if there's a drama, if there's you know some, I like it. I it, what what about why why? But I do. Oh, and the movies. My my most favorite movie series is Born. You all born supremacy, born ultimate, whatever. All three of those movies, great movies. But what was it? He was it was violent. He was killing people. So we have allowed the culture to infect us. Paul recognized that. Paul's point here is is to be. To, to, to set a sharp distinction between what we used to be and what we should be now. It's not just a few words on a paper. His words here, when you get to verse 20, he says, But you did not learn Christ in this way. It is emphatic. It is definite. He is not mincing words here. He wants us to understand you did not learn Christ in this way. Why does he use those words? It would give you the implication that he knew something about what they were doing, how they were living. It's interesting. um, when, When you think about this. Paul wrote Ephesians from prison, but he had visited Ephesus. And so he knew what was going on in Ephesus. If you remember some of your historical context, Ephesus was a, uh, a great city. The, the temple Diana was in Ephesus and was one of the seven wonders of the world at that time. And people would go there to worship Artemis or Diana. And and she was the the goddess of protection and provisions and and prostitution. And it, it was just, it was nasty to be very plain about it. They were making money. The Ephesian people were making money off of Diana. People would come there and, and the silver, silversmiths were making silver statues of Diana. And so this is the environment that Paul understood that the Ephesians were living in. And so he said, be careful. It's a warning sign. Be, be careful. You did not learn Christ in that way. John MacArthur wrote, The ways of God and the ways of the world are not compatible. The idea promoted by some who claim to be evangelical that a Christian does not have to give up anything or change anything when he or she becomes a Christian is nothing less than diabolical. That notion under the pretense of elevating God's grace and of protecting the gospel from works of righteousness will do nothing but send many people confidently down the broad way that Jesus says leads to destruction. We get saved and Believers get saved and we we hang on to stuff. In fact, we say kind of cavalierly, be patient with me. God is not finished with me yet. I'm still working on these things. Grace is sufficient. Superabounding grace is what we say, but 
But Paul here draws a very sharp distinction that the old life is gone. Be separated from it. He, he's concerned. Why is he concerned? Well, evidently he had good reason. In Revelations, turn there. Chapter 2. Starting at verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot endure evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have per perseverance and have endured for my namesake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else. I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Paul is sending believers a warning, a clarion call. You did not learn Christ in this way. We we need to govern ourselves according to the life that we are now supposed to be living. We have to be careful of what we say. We have to uh, be careful of what we look at. Guard, guard the eye gates. Guard, guard the heart. Guard the places that we go, the people that we, we, we engage with. I, I am a, um, well, I was going to call myself a golfer, but a golfer is someone that plays it very well. So I'm not going to say I'm a golfer. I, I swing the clubs and hit the ball, and I enjoy it. Sometimes I play with um, strangers and and I have to be careful because playing golf and, and playing with pe men you know it, it's, it's cool you know because you, you're out and you know you're bopping around the course and you know you're swinging and you, you're kind of encouraging each other and you have to be careful not to get caught up in what they do in the language, in the jokes, in the, the, all of the stuff that the culture does when men get together. And so whatever we do, we've got to be careful. Paul is saying, remember, you did not learn Christ in this way. Uh, he says, in fact, in verse um, 21, I'm sorry, 20. You did not learn Christ in this way. Well, first of all, the word there, learn, is, a, is an interesting word. It, it has the meaning of uh, conveying a basic idea to one's mind and producing an external effect so that depending on the context that this word is said in, you could be learning because of direct instruction, you could be learning because of practice and experience, you could be learning because you're comprehending what's being said to you. 
The idea here is genuine understanding and accepting the teaching so that it gets applied to your life. Now, what's interesting about God is that he will give us lessons to learn. And, and when we get them, it's great because then we go to that next level of maturity and growth. But it's interesting about God is that if he gives us a lesson and we don't get it, he's going to keep us right there and keep bringing stuff around to us until we learn it. Before we can go to that next level of maturity. He, he, he's interesting. He loves us that way. So the Ephesian Christians here, they, they probably learned from, from their teachers, from their apostles. Uh, I doubt that many of them actually saw Christ themselves. And so Paul is, is saying, you learned Christ and you probably learned Christ, not in that way, but in the way that the, the teachers, the apostles were teaching. In fact, in 1 Peter, uh, Peter gives the example of Christ having died for us. He's talking uh, to slaves and servants about suffering for good. And he gives the example of Christ being the one who suffered, even though he didn't do anything wrong, as an example. And so we as Christians should learn that example of being who we are, Sometimes we have to suffer, but it's okay because if Christ did it, that's my example so I can learn from that and I can suffer too. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed, verse 21, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him. The word there, heard, indicates that from someone you have heard about Christ. And again, this goes back to Paul in the fourth chapter where he says God gave us gifts. And these gifts to the body are apostles and prophets and teachers to teach us. So we can't say that we haven't heard. The hear, to hear is effectively hearing with the ear with the mind to respond in a way that changes how we live. So we can't say that we haven't heard it. It's, it's, it's not something that Paul, it's not a command that Paul is giving, but these are facts that Paul is telling us we should realize and institute them. It's because we have a union with Christ that we should be doing this. He goes on to say, and, and you have been taught in him. The word there, taught, is didasco. For any of you who are teachers, we get the word didactic uh, from this word didasco. And you might hear educators talk about didactic education or teaching. And, and what it means is a, it's a form of teaching where you actually engage the student's mind by using models or examples. If, in fact, turn to John. This is a great example here. Turn to John, the 13th chapter. Thirteenth chapter, verse twelve. And so, when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. 
For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. And so here Christ is teaching didactically. He's giving a principle to learn and he's giving an example and showing them. And then he's engaging them in the discussion about it so that they get it. Uh, a few guys, probably a couple of months ago, I handed out a, a sheet of paper with a picture on it. Some of you may remember that. And depending on how you looked at that picture, you saw an old woman. And if you looked at it a different way, you saw a young woman. Well, by using that picture, I was teaching didactically to engage your minds with mine and, and so that we arrived at the same place with the ultimate goal that that example would change how we saw things. That's what the, this Paul is saying here is that if you have been taught in him, then what you have learned, you should change how you live. And, and the if indeed there is not to say well, maybe it happened, but it certainly did happen. It's a, it's a clause that has a possibility to it, but by the fact that it is in the uh, indicative mood indicates that it happened, and it certainly did happen. So Paul is not questioning whether they were taught. He knows they were taught. He taught them. So it's not a command for us. It's a reminder. It's a, it's a, for Paul to tell us, you know by fact that you are different. And because you are different, then there is an expectation for us to live holy. Paul's um, heart for the saints comes through in a way of great concern and uh, encouragement and exhortation and love, hoping that the Ephesian saints, that all saints, would come to a place in our lives where we live according to the call. So, Father, we thank you this morning. And, and we pray, God, that you will, uh, first of all, forgive us uh, because we have fallen short. Uh, we do, at times, allow the culture to influence our, uh, our lives and our behavior, our thinking, our, uh, the things we look at, the things we say. God, it, it just... It's difficult at times, and yet we know that we have an intercessor, one who uh, understands and is, in fact, sitting at your right hand, interceding for us. Uh, he, he understands because he lived in this flesh and experienced this flesh, but without sin. 